Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Mikel Del Rosario, Cultural Engagement Project Manager for the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And our topic for today is music in the church. We're going to be talking about reconciling the generational divide in church music so the people from all generations can come together to worship God in unity. We have three guests in studio today. First is my friend Ryan Flanagan. Ryan is a folk artist and church music director at All Saints Dallas. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Good to be here. And we have Patrick Thomas. Patrick is the Associate Pastor of Music at Reunion Church in Dallas, and he also leads worship here at Dallas Theological Seminary in Chapel. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for having me here. Yeah, it's today. good to have you. It. And third guest is Daryl Bach to my right. Uh, Dr. Daryl Bach is the Executive Director of Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center and Senior Research Professor of New Testament here at the seminary. Thanks for being here, Daryl. It's my pleasure. Well, today we want to talk about this uh, whole idea of worship music and bridging the generational divide. We recently did a brown bag for our students here at the seminary with Ryan, with Patrick, and with some others on talking about how we can do this uh, better as a church. And so I want to start by just introducing our guests. And Patrick, you've been involved in church ministry for quite some time, doing music for over 30 years, and some of that's been right here at DTS. So would you just share with us a little bit about how you first got involved in music ministry? Um, I started playing in church when I was about nine years old, and um, told a little bit of this story in the brown bag that you mentioned. Um, we're playing with an angel choir and singing "Jesus Loves Even Me," I believe it was. Was it that or "Yes, Jesus Loves Me"? But I think it was "Jesus <laughs> Loves Even Me." It was a Jesus Love song. How about that? And it was out of the hymn book because that was the only way we were supposed to do it then. <laughs> Um, but uh, have a family background of uh, of music in church, and you know my grandparents on my mom's side loved loved the Lord, loved music. They didn't really sing or play, but they kind of forced their kids into it. And then my mom and her siblings all um, passed that on to their children as well. Mm -hmm. Even so, to where this is an interesting note that we had a family. Um, a family choir hmm. because my parent, my mom had 12 siblings. Oh, wow. So all of her siblings that lived in Houston and all of their kids <laughs> kind of had the Johnson family chorale, so to speak. And it was a chorale because it was a lot of people. But from a family standpoint, um, uh, music was very important um, to, to them, so they made sure that they instilled that importance in us. And um, in my dad had a heart to see me and my siblings. I have one brother, three sisters. We're all involved in, in music in some type of way. Um, and he wanted to instill in us the importance of using that for God. Mm -hmm. And so um, he encouraged us to serve with it. So that, that started early on and then um, took music to a different church after that and did, did some in undergrad, although I didn't degree in music. Mm -hmm. um, I did have quite a bit of um, – Involvement and influence in music during that time. So that's kind of how I got started. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. thanks for sharing that. Uh, yeah. Let me turn to you, Ryan. Uh, how did you get started writing worship music, and how did your time in, in seminary impact your, your musical direction? Well, I was raised in a Pentecostal church, hmm. um, and we were very, uh, very musical church. Uh, had a great music minister who. I learned a ton from just by watching, um, and it was a very expressive environment, um, very melodic, very choral, um, sang out of a hymnal as well, uh, the gospel hymns. And um, so I, I grew up in that environment, learned um, how to lead church music just by watching him, as I said, and um, probably it's at some point in my high school years, um, I heard a praise band sing an original song, and I was like, hey, wait a minute, you can write your own? <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I, I went home and got on the piano and started writing. This is probably junior year of high school, hmm. um, and I just haven't stopped. Um, and then uh, I came here to Dallas from Chicago uh, Back in 2000, attended Christ for the Nations Institute for two years, a charismatic Bible mm -hmm. college. Uh, and then I met the Reformers. 
And so I went to DBU. <laughs> uh, Dallas you smiled ba- when you said that. <laughs> and I went to Dallas Baptist University. Um, and uh, from there I went to Trinity Seminary, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School back up in Chicago. Uh, while I was there, um, I, I studied with Bob Weber, um, actually at a, a different seminary. And um, he was incredibly influential, uh, not only in um, just my life as a student, uh, as a you know seminary student in learning theology and that sort of thing, but um, in shaping you know what I would be doing in ministry, um, it's shaping my songwriting, um, and ultimately landing me in the same tradition that he was in, Anglicanism. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know uh, hmm. how much, uh, other, you know, specifically what, how it influenced me, but it was uh, foundational. Hmm. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Well, when we were together in, in the brown bag, we were talking about some of these uh, challenges that are facing worship leaders in the church today. And Daryl, you've been in church leadership for some time. Um, you're elder emeritus at your church uh, at Trinity. And how have you seen the, the challenges um, the worship leaders face change over the years? Well, I'm not sure they've changed. They've probably in some ways intensified with all the options that people have. You know, when I first went to church, it was um, piano, uh, three hymns, uh, you know, and that was what you did. And, and in some contexts, they were slightly more liturgical than, you know, even where the music and how the music uh, slotted in was pretty well determined. So you didn't have that many options. When things kind of opened up and you had possibilities of people doing music in a variety of styles in a variety of ways, you know, they, they put the, you know, all of a sudden guitars started showing up and then uh, then drums and then that cage that they put the drummer in to feel like, you know, at least treat the drummer like a human being. I mean, you don't have to imprison him while he's doing his music, you know. Isolate him and spotlight him, right? Exactly, right. right. (laughs) Yeah, what did he do, you know, so. uh, But uh, but anyway, and and with with those choices, of course, all of a sudden you started to touch people's preferences. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, I've been through churches that have wrestled with what we used to call, I think in the 90s, uh, even the worship wars and Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And some of that is still with us in terms of people's preferences and that kind of thing. And we worked really hard at the church that I was at to try and really encourage our parishioners to, um, to embrace a variety of style and talk to them consciously and directly about it. You know, our line used to be, well, if you don't like the piece of music that's coming now, just remember yours is coming later and the person next to you probably doesn't like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and so – and trying to build some sense of an awareness of different people have different tastes and different music speaks to different people in different ways and, and trying to get them to think less about themselves and their own preferences and open up to the possibility of what we're actually here to do, which is to share in, in one form, in one voice. Uh, a commitment to our uh, love for God, our love for Jesus, and what He's done through uh, uh, through the Spirit in us, and so, so that's how we attempted to tackle it. And and so we, our church personally, never went through. We went through music adjustment. We certainly went through that, but we didn't go through the battles that some people had because we worked pretty intentionally at communicating uh, what we were hoping for out of it in in, in making the moves. Um, we're now going through another move, which actually I, I think is interesting because this time we didn't talk so much ahead of time about what was going on. We just did it because we thought, oh, we've they've got it, you know. Hmm. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we made this shift, you know, it was like people were caught. Well, I'm not used to that, and we have to go. So we're all over again. You know, hit the reset button. Here we go. So, so all those tapes that we used back there are <laughs> probably going to be, you know, re reemerge and and because it's a new generation. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we we made two mistakes. I think one was we we didn't realize. Well, there are a lot of people here now who weren't here then. And, and secondly, we learned that people will say they want change, but when they experience the change, they don't necessarily embrace it That's right. when they do from a, as they do from a distance. Mm-hmm. And so those two things are at work, and, and we're 
we're in the middle of that one right now, so I'm kind of feeling like the guy in the airplane who has the seat belt around him, and the captain's come on and said, oh, a little turbulence here. <laughs> 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 so it isn't always easy. Yeah. Well, I remember when I was in high school, the just using a drum set. I grew up in a, in a Baptist church, and just using a drum set on the stage was a big area of, of controversy. But yet now the, the situation has changed, and we have a lot of grandparents who are the drummers in our, in our, in our bands, right? Well, and, and if I can comment on that uh, these struggles are a little different if you come out of a charismatic mm-hmm. background or African American. Um, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Not not that aren't, there aren't some African American churches that probably operate a little more rigidly mm-hmm. um, historically, but the one I was in, they were like the more drums, the more guitars, the more horns. You know, mm-hmm. they even tolerated us playing trumpet, saxophone, and trombone. Your problem was going to radical hymns, right? <laughs> uh, kind of, yeah. Well, it was like learning more than the first two verses. Yeah, yeah. Um, because um, like even some of those environments, you can go in and sing "How Great Is Our God." They know the chorus. You start singing the verses, it gets very quiet <laughs> because they may not know all the verses. But embracing the energy, mm-hmm. so to speak, and the and, and the freedom of expression in that has always been something that was embraced. At least in the in the background, I have and I'm probably similar to your background as well, right? In that regard. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you approach your uh, your role as a worship pastor? Understanding there's there's a variety of different, not just two, but a variety of, of sure. different generations now that are represented in front of us. Where you have, uh, like we mentioned, the older uh, generation are not the older generation of yesteryear, where they might be the drummers. Uh, where you have younger kids who might think a remix of a hymn they heard on the radio is actually a Crowder song, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> like, wow, David Crowder can write some really profound <laughs> lyrics, man. Have you heard that? <laughs> you know. Um, so how do you approach Approach your role as a worship pastor, understanding all those people are in front of you. Yeah, I, I think for me the first thing I do is is a humility before God as best I can, mm-hmm. um, and I say that carefully because um, that's a kind of word that an individual probably shouldn't throw around easily, like <laughs> humility, right? But it's it's getting it straight with me and God first, saying, okay, I've got my preferences, I have my likes and dislikes, but you've called me for a purpose in this regard and how can I submit myself to that and then from there then I think about you know who's going to be assembled and and at reunion we've got some old and some young um, we've got you know some with a lot of money and some who just walked in off the street homeless because we're right downtown across from you know Dallas Life Foundation and the bridge mm-hmm. and places like that and we want we want them to come to church mm-hmm. and we try to keep the ground level where they're not asking for money and we're not giving them money because we're there to worship now, if somebody wants to take them to lunch, side note, they're welcome to do that afterwards. But we're there to worship together. And so um, we have that. We've got you know people that come from a charismatic background and some that come from a high church, mm-hmm. very, you know, Western, rigid um, worship, you know, let's get it done in 35, 40 minutes kind of deal. And then we have those from African American and um, Hispanic culture where they're like, hey, Sunday is our time to just be together. Mm-hmm. So the service is never long enough for them because they're like, let's just be together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then we have some that are, are from, you know, um, some Africans, some Asians. Um, and it's interesting and fun leading music in this in this context because it keeps me challenged. And, um, I, again, I, this is one of the things I said earlier. I don't necessarily pick songs always that I like, but I try to search through what's the theology and what's the truth that God mm-hmm. wants us to be um, – communicating Mm -hmm. um, in this season and can I find and assemble some songs that do that well yet always also challenges us to be uncomfortable because I think one of the reasons why there are the preferential wars Mm -hmm. is because people believe that if they can get their preference met that eventually they will worship God and I think he's probably after something different Mm -hmm. that's right and so I approach it very uncomfortably beginning with me and I figure if I can be uncomfortable and I can worship God then maybe everybody else can as well so mm-hmm. now Ryan you've used the word evangelist to describe you, how you see your role and your approach to to leading worship songs tell us a little bit about that mm-hmm. uh, an evangelist is a storyteller an evangelist convinces people to believe the things that they believe to believe the truth um, particularly in in church music, as a as a uh, song leader who is evangelizing this congregation, um, 
it's my responsibility to proclaim the gospel in song. Um, and, uh, you know, th that's not sort of the, this modern reduction of the gospel to, you know, Jesus died for your sins, but this expansive understanding of the gospel. And in my tradition, uh, there's so much symbol and imagery and mm -hmm. um, beauty uh, to draw from uh, just to present, to proclaim before the people and to get them proclaiming uh, themselves uh, and enacting. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. What are some generational issues that, that you've seen throughout your, your time as a, as a worship minister? <laughs> uh, man, generational issues. <laughs> uh, well, the, the classic, uh, the classic um, you know, every generation wants, wants to do things their way. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they have particular styles. They have um, actually nostalgia. I think is probably one of the biggest mm. um, hindrances, maybe or challenges. Mm. Um, uh, you know, uh, people trying to re-experience or relive yeah. what they experienced mm -hmm. as a kid mm -hmm. or at a, a pivotal time in their life, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, several people. Um, uh, my, even within my own family, but in uh, in our church, went through the charismatic renewal of the the Catholic and Anglican Church in the late '70s, and um, and there's uh, you know they don't verbalize this, but you can see like they had a profound experience back then, mm -hmm. and they want that again, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and so. I'll get you know song suggestions like "Glorify <laughs> Thy Name" and mm -hmm. which I still do. You know, I, I'll do these songs, um, but there's this, you know, there's always a sound. There's a song attached to these mm -hmm. really big movements, you know, and uh, so nostalgia is a challenge. Um, yeah, you meant recre recreating. You mentioned recreating those experiences, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And it's kind of like from from a pop music standpoint. Mm -hmm. My wife and I have like very different tastes <laughs> in music, and I'll hear some, you know, some hip hop song or something like that from the '90s. I'm like, man, that beat has just got me in a zone. Mm -hmm. And then she'll be like, it does absolutely nothing for yeah. me. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think so many people bring that to mm -hmm. your point mm -hmm. to the experience where it's like, if I can recreate whatever I think this is in my mind. I will know I have worshipped, and isn't that coming from a good place? And my thought is maybe, yeah, but maybe not. Well, I think bef before you in in the congregation, people with all kinds of backgrounds like that, were there feeling, hey, this is when I felt the closest to God, mm -hmm. and if I could get that back again, and they feel like those are attached to songs and styles sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so at your church, it sounds like you have a multi generational and multi ethnic. Group. Yes, and it and it is challenging because really what you're trying to do is is really define a new thing in a sense. And I'm not saying everything we're doing is new. That's not the point. I'm grabbing from a lot of the same songs everybody else is, and then mm -hmm. writing a few along the way. But finding a central thing theme of how do we let the strongest commonality that we have, which is Christ, mm -hmm. be the centerpiece of our worship. Mm -hmm. And something I pray with the congregation every week is that, Lord, we want to see you in a greater light so that we can be caused to worship you. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I mentioned this earlier um, in, our, in um, our brown bag meeting. One of the, the pictures in my mind I have, again, is of a 70-year-old man, one hand on a cane and the other one trying to get it up as this guy is rapping these amazing <laughs> lyrics. Uh, one of our, uh, I call him our resident rapper. He has a song that he, it's called One Life, One Wife. And basically he, he, he talks about the oneness of, in the Trinity and how that oneness translates into he, his relationship with he and his wife as one. Mm. And he built, we sat down, we worked through some good theology and he has amazing lyrics. And so seeing this old man doing this, trying to get in with him on this shows that he understands the truth. But I think the thing that bridges that gap the most is not just the truth of the lyrics that he saw, but 
he was willing to build a relationship with that young man who mm-hmm. has nothing else in mm-hmm. common with him but Christ. Mm-hmm. And they learn to love each other. And as a result, he can support him when he's using his craft to encourage everybody else in the Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have you found, Daryl, that when it comes to uh, beginning to take steps to bridge these kinds of uh, divides, that the relationship with the worship pastor is, is a, a key part of that? Yeah, I think there are several elements. The relationship with the worship pastor, um, one of the challenges we had is we had a worship leader who really didn't like to speak to the congregation, just liked to move from song to song to song to song, kind of a uh, what I call a musical technician. You know, they knew the music, they could do it, they could lead it, they could get a choir to sing and sound beautifully. But to have this person address the audience was like pulling teeth. And so so that was hard because it was a, there wasn't the development of a personal connection between the worship leader and the audience in a way that that drew them into the to the story and the music and the sequence of what was mm-hmm. going on. So that was a challenge. The other relationship that I think is really, really important is the relationship between the pastor and the worship leader and the way in which they view the service, the way in which they mm-hmm. approach the service, et cetera. So, so you've really got all, all three factors. You've got, your, you've got your pastor, you've got your worship leader, and you've got your audience, and you're trying to get them all at least somewhat in the same room mm-hmm. <laughs> in terms of what's going on. Um, and, and I think what a lot of churches do is they just assume that it happens, that the music itself does it or something like that. And, and there, are, there are songs that do that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not denying that. But I, th- I do think a church is better off when there's a little bit of intentionality uh, tied to it and when, there's, mm-hmm. when there is good communication and that communication is happening between all those elements, those relational elements, which are being affirmed in the songs. We're singing about our relationship to God and mm-hmm. our relationship to one another in most cases, um, almost in all cases, in fact. Uh, and when that is affirmed by, by what's going with the music, I think that helps um, get people on. Uh, uh, at least, at least moving in the same direction, uh, and and frankly, fa- I find some of the stories behind some of the hymns and some of the courses um, particularly fascinating and compelling on their own terms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I mean, um, they're just um, you know the the story behind, for example, it is well with my soul, which. You know, I sung for years and didn't know, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden one day, Bill Bryan, former chaplain here, you know, took time in in the middle of a chapel to share what was behind that story and the yeah. loss and everything. Mm-hmm. And you're sitting here going, "Well, okay, this guy is saying it's well with my soul, but man, look what he's been through. He's lost his family mm-hmm. in a shipwreck." And I'm going, "He has a new meaning." To exactly it, right. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, yeah. you're going, "Okay, this isn't just words. Guys, put down on a page. He's really he has felt what he is writing," and and so I I think that helps uh, an audience to connect. Um, to to what you're trying to do in the context of worship. Mm-hmm. One of the things our church is about to go into a season of for, I guess, I don't know, maybe about six studies, maybe a little longer, is we're going to actually take songs that vividly have scripture listed in them, and that's what the Bible studies are going to be based on so we can encourage them. You know, how can songs lead you from scripture in a way, not just, oh, I feel good, this has this answer in it, but it's like, look at the theology that's here, and how is that impacting your worship? Mm-hmm. And that's going to, I think that's going to be huge. We've mm-hmm. got about um, about seven or eight, nine small groups, and probably 15 to 20 people in each one of those groups, and they're going to be breaking these songs apart, which I'm happy that they're allowing me to suggest five or six of the songs that they're mm-hmm. going to study, mm-hmm. which one of them will be like, you know, for instance, this, I believe the creed. Mm-hmm. You know, I believe in God our Father, mm-hmm. I believe in Christ the mm-hmm. Son. Great foundational stuff from the Apostles' Creed that we say we believe, but where are the verses to support that? How does that glue together what we say we really believe and what is the hope that we have in that and the message that we can um, – you know, show the world and represent as a result. I actually of know that. the person who encouraged the development of that song. Awesome. And, and um, you know, it's interesting because because the reaction that came when they finally you know he suggested, why don't you take some of the creeds and and put it to music? You're a talented musician, and so that's what happened. And when he saw the result, it was like, man, I, I, you know, uh, and we it blew him away in terms of, of what was going on. And I like your story about Fanny Crosby. You know, I like. The, here's one of the greatest hymn writers we've we've ever had, absolutely blind, 
Yeah. And and you were telling her story about the way she dealt with the question about blindness. Oh, yeah. She, yeah, she yeah somebody asked her, you know, how do you feel about writing about God all these years and he's never healed your sight? And her comment was, well, his face will be the first one I see, mm-hmm. which like mm-hmm. – <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. So mm-hmm. you know the the people the people who sit down to write music and who put lyrics together, et cetera. You know they aren't sitting down just trying to slap something together that goes into a service. They're usually pouring out of themselves something of their experience to God. I th- I think Ryan, you talked about the fact that you you see worship as telling the story of God in many ways, and and I and I think that's a really um, valuable way to think about it. We're, we're sharing something that we hold in common that actually draws us together. It's why mm-hmm. we're there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. this is the kind of thing that bridges that generational divide because our, our unity is not based on music style. Our unity is based on our identity in Christ. A- absolutely, because Christ prayed in the garden that we would be what? One. Mm-hmm. That's right. And it's interesting to see how many things of this nature that we allow to divide us Mm-hmm. And as a result, we don't really arrive at as a community where we should. Mm-hmm. And the scripture says, Jesus says, there's an evidential value to that, that the world will know that he is from God when they see this kind of unity that we have. Absolutely. And this is something that goes beyond generational, uh, you know, generational uh, divide. This is something that, that we share as Christians. And I find it so odd what we let of a divide us sometimes. You know, you, you, another remark you made earlier uh, at the Brown Bag was, you know, besides music, is the one thing that divides uh, churches um, maybe carpet color that comes <laughs> yeah. you know and, I, and, I, and actually I'm sitting there thinking you didn't you weren't in the church I interned at in which there was a debate about whether we have blue carpet to represent heaven or red carpet to represent the blood you know and, 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 and you know this is a red and blue debate that wasn't about politics all right okay but it had politics, although it did get political that's exactly right it had all kinds of politics and theology wrapped up in it right. and i'm sitting here going you know and and, and 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 sometimes you sit back you know and you're usually what happens is people years later go I can't believe we spent all that energy on that. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. uh, if if they recover on the other side from it all, and and yet sometimes we let that get in the way, and you think, how oh, silly. Yeah, I think it was um, James Pritchard from uh, First Baptist Forney was in in our chapel yesterday, and mm-hmm. one of the things he uh, he gave a little bit of history of the first church that he pastored, and one of the statements he made is they had it was time for them to do a building project, and there was eight people with a ringleader Mm -hmm. that was like, my parents got saved in this church, they were married in this church, baptized, buried in this church, mine as well, and my children. This church is important to us, and we will not build another building. And the thing was, it wasn't about the church. Mm -hmm. What was it about? Yeah, you could The building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reality is, when they died, that's when the building went. Because it's like at some point it's not about the building, it's about the people in the community. Hmm. But we can get it twisted where we get our preferences and you use the word earlier, Ryan, nostalgia, which I think is a great one, because usually there's some desire inside of us to get back to whatever that thing was that made us feel a certain way and then I my mind keeps going back to this it as well. Mm-hmm. It's like whatever that thing was for him, he didn't have it because you lose everything. Where is that connection to it? There's only hope in one place, and it's in Christ. Mm-hmm. But we let all these little things get so in the way, and we miss what is the core element. How do we get back to spirit and truth? Because he said, then we're really worshiping, because those are the worshipers I'm seeking for. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so we think about the creeds and these these things that unify us, and we were talking about using them in, in songs and using the liturgy in worship. Ryan, you told a story mm-hmm. during our brown bag together that I'd like you to share right now about how God really orchestrated this uh, this move toward toward breaking the generational divide that didn't entirely come from you. I'm sure mm-hmm. this, uh, what happened to, to kickstart this this project. Yeah, so I, I moved down here <clears throat> from South Bend, Indiana a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago, and a month into the job, I got an email from a parishioner, and it just said request in the subject line, <laughs> and we all love getting requests from parishioners. Uh, I opened it, and there was um, uh, uh, a poem in there uh, that he was suggesting that we use for Transfiguration Day. And... Um, 
I loved the poem. It was beautiful. So I picked up my guitar and I wrote a little folk tune to it, sent it back to him. And I said, by the way, who wrote this poem? I thought, it's great. We're going to sing it on Sunday. Hmm. And he responded. He said, well, I wrote the poem. And I was blown away. And then I said, <laughs> well, do you have any more poems? <laughs> uh, I want to write more tunes to these, to these poems. Awesome. Let's write hymns together. So uh, we sort of stumbled into a partnership. This is Father Nelson Kosheski. And uh, he's a 70, at the time he was 72, now he's 75. Um, and we've written 30 or so hymns together over the last wow. two years. That's great. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. And we have a mutual friend, Elizabeth Hamilton, who wrote an article in the Dallas Morning News about this. And you've been taking this mu- this worship music through uh, throughout DFW to other churches. How has that been received by the churches in this area? Um, it, Surprisingly well. Um, I don't know if it's just that you know hashtag liturgy is catching on right now in our <laughs> in our sort of church culture, um, or if people are just genuinely drawn to um, what we're doing. Uh, there are um, I, I find uh, that a younger generation of people are desiring more of what their grandparents desired than what their parents desired. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, they're longing for historical connectedness, um, something greater than their own sort of privatized individual spirituality. Um, mm-hmm. They want transcendence. They want beauty. They, they don't want a dichotomy between sacred and secular. Um, and it, it's not that I set out to sort of accommodate this new growing desire in mm-hmm. our culture, the millennials. Um, I just did what I, what I do, uh, write tunes. <laughs> so, um, and, and it seems, you said, you know, God seems to be orchestrating this. I mm-hmm. would wholeheartedly agree. Um, it's been really well received. Um, a great producer picked up or heard about the project and wanted to produce the, the first two volumes of it. So we did that. Um, and it's, we just had the beginning. And this is a multi-generational project in which your wife and kids yep, are involved kids. in it too? Yeah, my kids sing. Um, uh, how much detail you want me to go into about the, the records themselves? Yeah, you can so, talk about how the records so, came together. Yeah, so uh, volume one is consists entirely of um, uh, prayers from the Book of Common Prayer mm-hmm. that I set to tunes, including the Apostles' Creed. and. Most of them are verbatim, um, and uh, my kids sing on uh, the the first commandment. Um, we, we sing the first commandment, uh, and or the greatest commandment, and then um, they also sing the the dinner or grace song. Uh, Bless, O Lord, these gifts to our use and us to Thy service for mm-hmm. Christ's sake, Amen. And uh, and then so that's the first record. The second record uh, consists entirely of hymns that Nelson and I have written. And uh, yeah, I think over the past thirty, forty years, we've kind of lost this idea of uh, younger generation and older generation people working together to create art. And that's something that the church um, is is having the opportunity to recover now through projects like this. Yeah, you know, it was uh, a good friend of mine, African American fellow here, who makes documentaries in uh, in Dallas. Um, is working on racial reconciliation. Um, it's just doing some really great work. And he told me that um, one of the best ways to bring reconciliation, uh, whether it's race or age or you know any sort of division, is for people who are different than one another to come together to make something. Mm-hmm. 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 So you know, it, it's one thing to eat together. It's another thing to make dinner together and then mm-hmm. eat together. Yes. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, he, and it's true. So he and I sat down and wrote a song together, and like the immediacy of the bond of love between us, just nobody can take away the thing that we made, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, and so I, I feel like something similar is happening with Nelson and I and, uh, mm-hmm. and with the children in our church. And, and um, you make things together. Mm-hmm and uh, reconciliation happens. You know, it's interesting when you read statistics about how many young people are leaving the church today, and one of the things that they say is those who have um, intergenerational ministry uh, tend to stay. They tend to stick around longer. 
And it's just interesting that we have, we've seen that, I've seen that in doing refugee ministry, doing worship ministry in the Philippines, and it just seems to, it seems to work. And it's so great to see, you know, a mom with her kid, uh, you know, a dad with, with his son playing together um, on the team. Have you guys seen um, any, any one of you intergenerational worship teams um, doing that in a church that has really been making a difference? Um, one of the blessings um, that I have currently, and um, she's out just for a, a few weeks because of a surgery, but um, our pastor's daughter is singing on our worship team now, and I've seen her grow up. Mm-hmm. And we were kind of sitting in the room. Um, I rehearsed with the with the singers, um, our main singers, and we sit down and say, okay, I'm praying about stuff for the next few months. Tell me, um, what are your favorite you know, hymns that you think we should include in that and why? And then she chimed up and said, well, whatever favorite hymn I have, I learned it from you because you're the person that's taught me. And I thought about it in that moment. Mm-hmm. I was like, she's absolutely right. I raised her musically, and I have for- completely forgotten about this because she was just a little kid, mm-hmm. you know, maybe seven or eight years old when I started. So I have mm-hmm. been the main voice in her life uh, from a music and worship standpoint. And to see her grow up and say, I don't like missing this, and I want to be a part, and I want to help you lead. Communicates that something's working, mm-hmm. and you know she's probably in her early twenties, and then we've got some that are in their early fifties that are that are in a part of the team, and it's pretty cool to see that. And then mm-hmm. throughout our AV area, we've always tried to mentor. Like you know, another blessing is my eleven-year-old son. Our church does not have a building we set up and tear down, so that adds a whole bunch of community Mm -hmm. at the front of each service, which is amazing because if everybody doesn't get involved, it doesn't Mm -hmm. happen for Mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. And I just got everything organized and delegated where I don't have to be there. And then my 11-year-old son says, Dad, I want to set up drums every Sunday, which means I have to get up earlier. (laughs) (laughs) But it didn't shock me, you know, maybe I'm tearing up as I'm thinking about it, that he wanted to serve because Mm -hmm. he has watched me and his mom Mm -hmm. serve in the community and connect with people, and it's what he loves to do, and he looks forward to it Mm -hmm. every single week. Mm -hmm. And so forget the sermons I've preached Mm -hmm. and forget all the fussing and all the stuff we say. That's the evidence to me that maybe this does work Mm -hmm. because when they're not just saying, I want to hear the music, but they're wanting to serve and interact with the community, I think it means we're heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, while you're talking, something came to my mind just about, um, you know, all throughout the scriptures you see um, the generations before us teaching us. And, you know, I think there's something in the Levitical um, priestly structure that, that says, you know, if you're 50 years old, you know, turn over your job to the 25 year old. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, you see, we, we, we learn from what's been handed down to us and what's been handed down to us and what's been, you know, um, and I'm just thinking about music and, and how, um, you know, we have the content of hymns and songs, the songs themselves have been handed down to us, but what about, what about style of music? Um, it, it's, it almost seems like there's a, uh, there's this movement in the, ch- the modern church that says, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, I'll, I'll take some of the content that's been handed down to me, but I've gotta be completely innovative with the style, or I've, I'm gonna mimic the culture or, you know, listen to, uh, you know, I'll, co- I'll create ex nihilo, you know, what, right. uh, <laughs> how our music sounds. But, I, but as you're talking, I'm right. thinking, you know, I think one of the, the reasons that we see all generations engaging in worship is because, you know, uh, I'm trying to be faithful to the sound that has been handed down mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we don't even have an organ, but I can, you know, there's still a way to be faithful to the sound that's been handed down, um, mm. uh, both from from a folk sort of standpoint, but also from you know a higher sort of uh, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. 
tradition. Now your your project is called liturgical folk, and putting those two words together is kind of <laughs> difficult for some people. Sometimes. <laughs> Help us understand uh, what liturgical folk music is and how you talked about keeping your ear to the ground to, to understand that. Yeah, I, when I heard the yeah. title, I thought you were just talking about who you're hanging out with. We're mm-hmm. liturgical folk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first tagline. The, the first tagline for the project was liturgical folk. Music for liturgical folk. <laughs> <laughs> now we're in the zone. <laughs> but it's funny you should say that. It almost seems like a, a contradiction. To, in my mind, it's it's almost redundant because it almost means the same exact thing to me. Like the the liturgy is the work of the people, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and folk is basically what comes out of the ground in a place, mm-hmm. right? Um, yeah, uh, li- liturgical folk was. Uh, somewhat inspired by a book that J- uh, Jamie Smith wrote uh, a while back called Desiring the Kingdom, uh, in which he, he says, you know, we, it's, it's sort of a philosophic anthropology, he says mm-hmm. we are primarily uh, worshiping creatures, liturgical creatures, even before we're thinking creatures and before mm-hmm. we're mm-hmm. believing creatures, we are worshiping creatures because w- we... We, we are what we love, we become yeah. what we love, we, we desire, therefore we are, right? Mm-hmm. Not I think therefore I am, but I mm-hmm. love, therefore I am. Mm-hmm. And, you know, litur- so liturgical folk is, it is the people, but it's also <laughs> yeah. the sound. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a project, but it's also, I think, a category, um, because I don't think it's anything innovative, what I'm doing. I think it's. Um, I think a lot of people are doing it, have been doing it, and I just put a name to it. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, a sticker, you put a sticker on it. Too. Put a sticker on it. <laughs> so let's turn now to what we would say to pastors, to worship leaders who are thinking about how can they better serve their congregations and help bridge this generational divide. Daryl, what would you say to, to pastors? Well, the first thing I'd say to pastors would be um, don't treat the service as if what you do in the Word is detached from everything else that's going on around it. Mm, that's right. That, um, that I happen to be in a church that observes communion every week, and our philosophy is that everything's driving our service towards the table and the reflection and remembrance that happens there. And so, um, uh, and so we very much tried to think about how the music, the message, and the table all fit together in, in, a, in the context of a, of a given service. And, and I think you, um, you, you, when you talk consciously about what you do in the service to your congregation, um, you help them recognize that they're not just consumers coming in to treat a worship service like they would go through a cafeteria. That's right. Mm-hmm. And um, you, and you don't want them. You don't want them there. You you want the, for that reason. You want them there because they are coming to participate in a service, to to reflect on their relationship with God, to draw instruction from that, to celebrate their community and their oneness in Christ in the midst of that, and to sing about it, mm-hmm. and to and to rejoice in it, and to or in some cases maybe to to lament in, in where they've been, but but in in one way or another to sh- to show that cohesion. And I think too many pastors, once if their church gets to the point where they move beyond just having a pastor and they get to where they where we're going to have a worship leader, that what they do with that hire is they hand it off. Mm-hmm. And okay, that's your area, mm-hmm. and and there's no connection. And right. and I just think that is um, that is, that that that's not the way to to think about the worship in your service because in the end. What the what the leadership as a whole reflects about the service and the role of the music in the service is going to contribute significantly to how that service is viewed. Mm-hmm. Patrick, yeah. if you could give just one piece of advice to a worship minister who is wanting to think about how to do this better, what would you say? I would say that he or she needs to understand that they have a very important role because we're encouraging people in the eternal things. Mm. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is there's no preaching in heaven. The last time I checked, and maybe I need to reread all that. Again, <laughs> there's no Bible study. You know, there's worship. There's singing and, and just complete adoration to an amazing God who has done so much that we can't even, you know, 
contain it. Mm-hmm. And so we hopefully um, get to be cheerleaders and educators towards that concept on this side, saying, hey, can we just get us to practice together? You know, there's an old quartet song, um, and here, here's a great gospel name for you here, uh, Willie Neal Johnson and the Gospel Keynotes. The <laughs> oh, quartet, <wow. laughs> they're a little quartet band that used to get up and sing, and they had, I mean, they had some good flavor. But they used to sing a little song that says, this is just a rehearsal. When we get to heaven, we're going to really sing. Mm, mm. And the whole concept was, at some point, can we just get together here on this side? You know, we've been talking about the multi-generational gap. Mm-hmm. Can we get by that? Can we get by all of the preferences and say, can we center on some truth here? We're, we're singing about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at what he's done for us. Can we agree that that is something more amazing than we could ever imagine? If so, can we sing about that together as a community? Yeah, yeah. Can, well, Patrick, before we run out of time, I did want to bring this out and ask right. if uh, people wanted to check out this CD that you have, Rev P Under the Influence. Where <laughs> yes. can they check that out? Uh, they can check that out at um, www.revp.org. Um, and um, yeah, you can email me there or find some of the songs there. That's an interesting project that we worked on a few years ago, and it's not all worship music, but it's all God music. (laughs) All right. (laughs) And then Ryan's got two CDs with uh, liturgical folk. The first one is called Table Settings. The second one is Eden Land. And where can people check this music out? Uh, Liturgicalfolk.com or uh, liturgicalfolk.bandcamp. And they can stream all the music there. Absolutely. And they can buy the CDs as well. And songbooks, yeah. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Daryl, for being a part of this podcast. Pleasure. Thank you, Ryan, for being here. Absolutely. Thank you, Patrick, as well. Thanks for the invite. It's been great talking about uh, bridging the generational divide in worship music. Stay with us on The Table Podcast. We hope to see you next week where we discuss issues of God and culture. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.